lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Hey, you cut me off. You took my line. <laughs> no. I have so few lines, and you took them. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, uh, I was really aiming to get that in before you at some point. <laughs> well, you succeeded and tonight. I, I've successfully thrown you off, too. Yeah, now I'm all thrown off. <laughs> well, it's already weird enough, right? We're in a different room. Yeah, we're in the wrong room of the house for this. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, so I have an electrical problem in my office that cropped up day before yesterday that yeah. I, I haven't figured out how to fix. And yeah. actually, I think we more or less determined that it's not really fixable. Yeah, I don't think there's a whole lot you can do other than replace the fan. Yeah. Or, I don't know. I mean, like... Replacing I a, some parts somewhere along yeah, the way anyway. Yeah. I mean, I suggested just hot wiring it and going with it, but... <laughs> yeah. I don't know how safe that'll be. I don't I, know. Yeah, it yeah. may be fine. I don't know. I'm just not an electrician. <laughs> me either. Yeah. In fact, uh, electricity terrifies me. Well, I know just <laughs> enough to get myself in trouble, so... Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of my earliest memories is electrocuting myself. Yeah. <laughs> when I was like three. <laughs> Fork in the socket? Fork in the socket. No, not not quite. It was actually one of those uh, horseshoe connectors. You Ooh. know, the kind that you screw down? I do, yeah. Yeah, I stuck in one the of those. socket. <laughs> I stuck one of those in the socket yeah. while we were in Puerto Rico. And I remember a sharp pain in my hand, and then I remember waking up on the other side of the room. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I'm not sure what happened in between. The in between there, yeah. <laughs> Um, my hand still hurt though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you knew what you had done, right? <laughs> yeah. I never did it again either. Yeah. It's a lesson learned. There you go. Um, so anyway, we're, we're in a different room in the house. So if there's an echo, like I, I'm, the acoustics just aren't as good in here cause it wasn't made. Yeah. I didn't plan this room around recording in here. So. Yeah. Well, we don't have the table set up the same way with the blanket and stuff. So. No. Nope. To dampen that. Nope. I'm sure that's going to have an effect. A bunch of flat walls. Yeah. It definitely feels a little echoey in here. So. Yeah. But you should be able to fix some of that. Hopefully. So, yeah, I'll take as much of it as I can out in post. Yeah. But apologies <laughs> if the sound quality isn't what you're used to. Hopefully by next week it'll be fixed. Yep. What if you have the hot wire or not? Yeah, it's some, one way or another. Or we'll just, like... I don't know. Bring mining lights in. Or <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'll bring my headlamp. I'll, I'll, you know, we'll see if we can find some of those like late night road worker things and yeah, grab ah. a couple of those. That'll do yeah. it. I think if we get a pair of headlamps, we'll be all right. A pair of headlamps. <laughs> <laughs> Look like a, be warned though. I'll have to use headlamp voice. So I don't know if I can do a whole podcast in headlamp voice. I don't think I can allow you to. <laughs> you don't think so? Nope. <laughs> You weren't using headlamp voice earlier when you had the headlamp on, by the way. It's true. Yeah, you <laughs> so, caught me. <laughs> <laughs> clearly, you don't so, have to. So, yeah, so you're saying I have some level of control here? It seems maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> that's a possibility anyway. Um, okay. Well, I, I thought we could start by talking about Ukraine again. <laughs> You want to start with Ukraine? Ukraine yeah, at wanna, the top. Uh, yeah, I want to start with Ukraine because I kind of want to pick up where we left off on the last podcast. Like, um, I, there's been some developments on the uh, Minsk was just a um, a ploy to buy time thing. So now um, uh, Petro Poroshenko has also said that. Oh, really? Yeah, he's like confirmed more or less what Merkel said about. Um, that that the negotiations over the Donbass that they had in Minsk in 2015, I guess, um, that they were just that they had never intended to um, honor them. That it was just to buy time for Ukraine to build up its military and build up its economy for the eventual war with Russia. Really, I still think that's a lie. Um, I mean, in all honesty, it doesn't. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but it does serve a purpose now um, for these people. Like, you know, Merkel doesn't want to appear that. Well, first off, she doesn't. Now it's it's definitely not in vogue to have had any kind of serious discussions with Putin ever in your life. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and uh, secondly you know, saying that you had intended for this agreement to work out makes you look like a failure Yeah. now as well. 
Yeah. So I, I still think that it's a lie, but it's just posturing. Yeah. Um, but I think that the lie has, uh, some really important implications, um, as to like how this plays out from here. I mean, we already pointed out last week that, um, now, you know, you set up a situation where you have said that, well, we weren't negotiating with Putin in good faith. And so you have definitely disincentivized him to negotiate in now. the future. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is also, I think, maybe part of the plan here, like why this is effective. is Like if you yeah. don't want the war to end, yeah. um, a good way to do it is to make the other side believe that negotiations are worthless. Yeah. Right. Um, oh, now I'm doing the right thing. I keep hearing it all over the place. So finish my sentence with right. Oh, <laughs> I didn't even catch it. My it, bad. It's, it's working its way into my speech now too. All right. I, I've got to, I've got to avoid that. It drives me crazy when other people do that. I got to not. <laughs> all right. So I'll start calling you out. Okay. Or I'll try to. I, I can't, I can't let this happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but <sighs> I, I, I don't know. I don't think that we have like a real understanding in the West of that there's political pressures in Russia too yeah. on, on Putin specifically to do things or not do things. And there, there are people that in his country that have some influence and power and he's not, I mean, he's a good, like he's a strong leader there. Like he's a popular leader. Yeah. Um, but he's not, he's not unassailable. Yeah. Right? Like he can still use, I did it again. <laughs> he can still lose his power. And so he has to um, be responsive to some level to the political pressures of other groups, opposition groups and so forth within his country. Yeah. One of those op opposition groups is a uh, more hardliner um, anti-Western, uh, you know, coalitions yeah. that, are, have been saying the whole time that you can't trust negotiations with the West, that they don't uh, take us seriously. and that, They don't hold up their end of bargains. Yeah, they won't, they won't do what they say, and they're not negotiating in good faith. And so now what you've done is you've, you've validated all of that. Yeah, you proved them right. And that's just given the hardliners more power in yeah. Russia, like well, and it, it creates more of those hardliners because True. just just like in this country, like you, these people say once the, once the once they're proven right, more people are going to join their cause. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, we've seen that type of thing here and di with different things. I think of COVID immediately. Yeah, like you know, well, you know where else we've seen it is in Iran. Oh yeah, where we didn't negotiate in good faith or. Trump pulled out of the JCPOA with no real reason to do so. Yeah. No justifiable reason to do so or no, nothing provable. Yeah. As far as anybody could tell, at least all the international observers and so forth, Iran was still holding up their end of the deal. Yeah. And the U S just pulled out. Yeah. Just quit. Yeah. Uh, for no real reason. Um, and then the result of that is the, the, kind of more um, diplomatic wing of Iranian government that was in power at that time lost the next election to hardliner anti-Western groups, death to America kind of Iranians. Yeah. I mean, that's not because, because they gained popularity because they were just like what we're saying. They were proven right. Right. It validated their position that you can't negotiate with the West that they won't they won't negotiate in good faith that they won't uphold their end of the deal. Yeah. And so forth. Yeah. So we, we seem to not be learning. <laughs> All right. On the other hand, that could exactly be the point. Yeah. I mean, if you want to like just tie us up in this, this debacle, that's one mm -hmm. way of doing it. Keep feeding the military industrial complex. Keep yeah. privatizing is, those public funds. Yeah. Which is what this is about. I mean, yeah, I think so too. At least largely. Uh, here's the other thing that it does, though, is that it, if it's true that uh, the Minsk negotiations were just a delaying tactic to give the West, NATO, Ukraine time to prepare for a war with Russia, uh, then 
it shows that the the West, that NATO, that the U.S. and yeah, the this agreement was negotiated with uh, France, Germany, and Ukraine and Russia. Yeah. Um, it just shows that the West never had any intention of a peaceful solution for the problems in the Donbass. Yeah. And that that speaks <laughs> ill of us. Yeah, because that should always be the goal. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, we're the U.S. Nobody really looks at us as the peace. I mean, we may make that claim, but we're <laughs> not. we're the peacekeepers? Yeah, but we're not the peacekeepers. Like, mm -hmm. we're the war machine. Make no mistake. Yeah. We're, we're the peacemakers in the same way that the Colt pistol back in the day was the peacemaker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it, it's... Uh, it's disappointing to think, though, that that might actually be true, that yeah. uh, that the Western governments negotiated a peaceful solution for the problems in the Donbass without any intention of ever honoring it and knowing full well that if they didn't, that it would come to a military conflict. Yeah. And and actually kind of made the agreement with the intention of it eventually coming to a military conflict. Yeah. And now we're holding Russia responsible for all of it. Yeah. And not to say that they're not. I mean, they made they, they made, made decisions. Yeah. And there are other things that they could have done in the meantime to, to well, to delay a war. I, I still think that it's not it's not without reason for Russia to have gone ahead and invaded under the circumstances that we outlined last week. Yeah. That the West essentially said, We're building an enemy for you on your border and how long do you wait? Yeah. You wait until they're fully prepared where they can actually deal with you in a real war? Yeah. Doesn't seem like a good plan. Um, you know, some guy says that he's going to beat you up, uh, but give him three months to train and prepare. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Maybe a preemptive strike is... <laughs> Especially you see this guy going to the gym every day. <laughs> exactly. And and taking Muay Thai classes or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So, or steroids. But there's other things that the... <laughs> I think mostly it would have been about um, image, really, uh, that Russia could have continued to call for different things that would have made the rest of the made it clear to the rest of the world what hypocrites the West was yeah. in this, um, such as uh, calling for the West to monitor elections in those regions in the Donbass and in Crimea. Yeah. Say, OK, you think that the elections were were fraudulent. You come run elections. Yeah. Uh, to see if they want to join um, Russia or stay a part of Ukraine. Yeah. You really think that we would have, like, entertained that thought? No, because we know what the outcome would have been. The outcome would have been exactly what it has been. Yeah. Well, that's kind of what I'm getting at, is, I mean... What... But it would have drawn attention to the hypocrisy in it. Yeah. If you're out there, like, screaming about democratic values and self-determination and so forth... Yeah. But then you don't want to allow it to happen in the places that you don't think it'll go your way. Yeah. I mean, in the in the eyes of the rest of the world, there's a clear statement made there. Yeah. Um, you know, al alternatively, uh, you could just continue to point out the, I mean, both sides have been breaking international law in this, but, and they've actually been arguing from different points because, you know, the rule of law is a myth. Yeah. Right? Like if you... You can um, argue any side if you got the if you got a, a good mind. Like yeah. everything is contradictory in all of these laws, including international law. There's contradicting laws, and so two sides can be equally right, taking completely different perspectives. Yeah. So, but it, at least it would have drawn attention to um, some of the issues. Um, what are the other things I said that they could have done? I, like we were talking about this the other night, and yeah, I, I'm, I probably should have made some notes about you know <laughs> immediately some afterwards. Of the, yeah, some of these things that that Russia could have done differently. Um, they could have called for uh, for a third party, um, you know, Brazil or India or somebody to to bring peacekeepers into the Donbass. Yeah, honestly, they could have just waited until um, until the Ukrainian military attack the Donbass, which they were clearly preparing to do. Yeah. I mean, they had been and hitting then, it with artillery strikes all the time, and they had stepped up their artillery strikes by a huge amount in the weeks leading before, up to, to, before yeah. the invasion. Yeah. So they could have let it happen, but that would have been death knell for Putin at home politically. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, definitely could have uh, made more of an effort at the United Nations, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, uh, except that we know how that goes too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's we basically are the United Nations. Well, we, we buy everybody off. Yeah, with foreign aid and yeah, and other tricks and yeah threats. I'm sure too. Oh yeah, yeah. It it wasn't that long ago that the Cablegate stuff came out that said that we were spying on the the UN delegations of like every country in the world, <laughs> including our allies. So yeah, um, maybe they should move the UN out of the United States. I don't know if that would help, but <laughs> yeah, all right. it might. Uh, but the, I mean, there were options. There were things that could have been done without the invasion. But I don't. To it, it was definitely a mistake, and and Russia is an aggressor in this. But to um, make the claim that it was unprovoked, yeah. Because remember that was the buzzword for a long oh, time. Yeah. Uh, Putin's unprovoked invasion. Putin's unprovoked invasion. Russia's unprovoked invasion. Well, that's just a lie. Yeah, it's definitely not unprovoked. Yeah. It, it, so it's not well, it's then, not fair to say that it was without reason. It may not be justified, but it's not without reason. Yeah. Well, and the narrative is still out there now being pushed hard that, well, he's trying to rebuild the Soviet Union. Like he's wanting to take all of these countries back and all of this territory back and rebuild. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't know. I just haven't seen any evidence to support that. But the claim is made pretty frequently on like normal media. Yeah. Well, there was a story that came out that said that uh, William Byrne, who's the director of the CIA, had been sent over to Kiev a couple of weeks ago uh, to try and convince, um, what's his name, uh, Zelensky, to agree to essentially giving up about a fifth of Ukraine yeah. to Russia for peace. Yeah. And he refused. And the Russia, the reports say that Russia refused as well, probably because they don't think that they could trust yeah. the result. But um, the, you know, there is some some talk that there's a real split within the administration, and it may just be that Biden has no idea what's going on. So the various factions that are trying to control him within yeah. within the executive branch are have different opinions going on what to it, do. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, essentially the two sides though are like, um, Byrne and Sullivan, which I was a little surprised because I think Sullivan is a hawk too, but, uh, well, actually I guess what they want doesn't mean that he's not a hawk. He's just not a hawk for Russia. Yeah. He's a China hawk. Oh yeah. So, uh, Byrne and, and, um, Jake Sullivan, uh, want to get, away from Ukraine so that we can concentrate our resources on a future war with China. Yeah. Essentially. Uh, and that Sullivan and, um, what's, is it Millie? No, no, no. Uh, Lloyd Austin. Yeah. Um, that, uh, not Sullivan. Um, the other guy, Blinken. Oh, Blinken. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I always, they're practically the same person to me, <laughs> Blinken and Sullivan. Yeah. Apparently not though. Uh, but Blinken and, uh, Lloyd Austin, um, want to, you know, really put the screws to Russia in this. So yeah, good old cold warriors. Yeah, and uh, on the uh, on the China front, there's the the big news yesterday was their spy balloon, <laughs> their very dangerous spy balloon over Montana or right. wherever. Uh, and uh, now, first off, like I, I, who knows? I guess all these balloons kind of look the same, but when I saw the pictures of it, because we we went to a um, restaurant last night for um a friend's birthday and they sat me down in front of a great big tv show in cnn which was infuriating by the way <laughs> like i there's a reason that i don't watch that yeah. mainstream news stuff it was it's driving, hard oh, man like... man but uh they kept showing the pictures of this balloon and it just looked like a weather balloon to me it looks like <laughs> all the weather balloons look and and, yeah. and you know, well, I wouldn't put it past China necessarily to use low tech to, to deliver spy. their high tech. <laughs> yeah. Uh, even the Pentagon had said, and the intelligence agencies were saying that there, there's nothing that they could glean from any, uh, spy balloon. Yeah. Any, any devices that they had attached to this balloon that they couldn't get from a satellite in low earth orbit, which they have. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so it, the whole thing's just kind of absurd. 
on its face, as far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned, of course you got like real hawks out there like Rubio saying, we should have shot that thing down. And, you know, <laughs> but Beijing has said, Hey, it's just a, it's a civilian scientific weather balloon. It's just, it's just got scientific instruments. There were strong winds, took it into us airspace. We regret it. Sorry. They're trying to spy on our weather. They want Which, to know what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. What we're doing to our weather. Yeah. Right? A lot of people that would say that's a perfectly reasonable yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> the weather control. Yep. But I don't, I don't believe in you, that. You don't prescribe I, to that. No, no, <laughs> no, I don't. Um, but you know, it. There's no reason to think that it's anything nefarious. Yeah, I, there really isn't. Yeah, there's nothing to be gained. Yeah. And if you wanted to spy on the U.S. as a uh, as an enemy nation or a competitive yeah. nation. Why would you do something that's so obvious? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Why is the weather balloon the tech? Maybe it was a test balloon so they can start like weather ballooning over bombs or something. Maybe. This, Maybe this the, was a, the Japanese tried this, to do this that. This could have been a dry run, man. Yeah, I guess that's that's true. It's a shame we didn't shoot it down then. <laughs> right, and show them what we're made of, right? <laughs> right yeah, I'll shoot down that balloon. <laughs> right, scramble the jets, land <laughs> or yeah, land all the planes and scramble the jets. <laughs> yeah, to me, the nefarious part is that it it was used as an excuse yeah. uh, to cancel high level diplomatic negotiations with China next week. Anthony oh. Blinken, Anthony Blinken was scheduled to go to China and meet with their foreign minister and possibly uh, Xi Jinping. That's um, garbage, man. And it was, they canceled it because of this. That's insane. Now, that's ridiculous. Over a freaking weather balloon. Yeah. Um, what or happened? a spy balloon. Even if it was a spy balloon, doesn't that seem like something that would be important to go talk about? Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. If we, <laughs> if you really buy that that's what it is, which, yeah. I mean, I see no reason to, but, I mean, even if the, our own Pentagon is saying, look, that's not what this is. Well, they like, didn't what say it's not what it was. They said that it wouldn't be useful. Useful, yeah. <laughs> well, that's just it. I mean, if... Yeah, I mean, if they've got satellites that can pick up the same stuff that's mm -hmm. already that we know are already up there, yeah, like why would this weather balloon be the route to go? <laughs> so I don't know. No. I don't have an answer. No, <laughs> that's that's insanity. So what did they do with the weather balloon? Did they just let it go on its way, or did they capture it? Uh, no, as far as I know, it's still floating around in the Midwest somewhere. Oh, I hope it, <laughs> I hope it ain't got no bomb on it. Right. Well, <laughs> I, yeah, I hope not too. Um, they did say that the instruments that they have attached to it are the size of like two school buses. Really? So it's a good size. Yeah. This yeah. is a, it's big. Yeah. Huh. It's big. That's interesting. Well, not I, easy to hide though. Yeah. Right. It's, it's definitely there. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's like, a, it's like if you sent a spy in a pink and purple suit that said, I'm a spy <laughs> yeah, on right. the back. Well, that's the way you do it, In right? In gold letters. Nobody suspects that guy. It, right. <laughs> <laughs> Got to hide in plain sight, man. Yeah, that's not hiding in plain sight. That's not what they mean when they say <laughs> hiding in plain sight. That's not what they mean by that? No. Um, I mean, I don't have anything more to say about that. I just, I, I thought it was important to bring well, that up. Well, that is ridiculous that they're they're canceling high-level meetings over that. Like, yeah. like, that really is, like, that's a serious problem. Yeah, you know? somewhere along the way... Um, the United States decided that we have such a powerful mi military that we don't need to negotiate with anybody about anything ever. Yeah. And that um, negotiation is just a, an opportunity to go in and say, if you don't do what we want, we're going to send our military. That's yeah. what negotiations are for the U.S. anymore. And that doesn't accomplish anything. Um, negotiations require compromise. Well, it does accomplish plenty for the military industrial well, complex. Sure. The people that are building these, this military, like, yeah, but it, for all the rest of us, in fact, um, you know, I'm going to play a quick clip right here, all right. uh, from Admiral something or other, uh, a NATO Admiral. I can't remember his name, all right. um, but here we go. All right. Uh, we need to, um, increase the production in the defense industry and now more and more, that is a, 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 a discussion that is ongoing in the nations, but it might also require some prioritization in terms of um, certain raw materials, uh, certain production facilities that are required for uh, defense production instead of for civilian production. Okay, so... The idea of switching to a, a wartime economy is a terrible idea. 
Oh. It's just going to make us all poorer. I mean, that's exactly what you were just saying, right? Is yeah. that it, it's good for the military industrial complex. Sure. But you got to. <laughs> the economy is more than that. Yes. Yeah. And there are a lot of people that still make the claim that World War II got us out of the Depression, but that's just a lie. Yeah. The end of World War II got us out of the Depression. Yeah. Um, when everybody came back and went to got, work. Became productive again. Yeah. That's yeah. when the the Depression ended. Um, the, you remember there was, uh, what, oh gosh, what do you call it? What's the word? Um, when you um, have limits on how much of things that people can buy. Oh, rationing. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So they they did rationing during World War II. Yeah. That's not the sign of a healthy economy. Right, yeah. Right. <laughs> and what you have to remember is that while, while wealth is not a fixed pie, yeah. I, and I know, you know, people that are on the left that listen to the podcast are, you know, a lot of them believe that wealth is a fixed pie and that what's happening is that wealth just keeps being transferred from poor people to rich people. Yeah. But wealth can be created, but it can be created through productive measures, through um, efficiencies and technological advances and, and so forth. But building, using the productivity of people in the economy and resources, because that, that's the other thing that he said there is that, um, that we had to prioritize resources for the, uh, for the military industrial complex, for the military economy. Yeah. But what that means is that people, you know, building houses and apartment buildings and grocery stores and whatever yeah. aren't getting materials to do those things. Yeah, because of the rationing. Because right, I mean that <laughs> well, that is. I mean potentially. Exactly I mean is. depending on how bad it gets. Yeah. Like, well, if they're talking about prioritizing resources to the to the military instead of to civilian stuff, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's on a higher level. Yeah. But that's it's the same as rationing. Yeah. And um, if they're using the the productive capabilities of the economy to create things that aren't of value to us. To the people in the economy. Right. Yeah. Um, and instead are, are generally intended to be disposed of halfway around the world. Yeah. And, uh, make their, and, and make their economy less productive. Yeah. It's literally... Okay, so you're taking resources um, out of any kind of productive use and literally putting resources into destructive use. Yeah. And as we covered plenty of times before on this podcast... Um, destruction is not, does not generate wealth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it, it can, it going can, around busting windows don't work. Yeah, it, it can be, um, it can be profitable for a select group, but for the economy as a whole, wealth is lost. It's hurt. Yeah. And so any, um, any resources that are put into the military are not being used for anything productive at home mm-hmm. and are, are actually stealing wealth from our economy and putting it into this very limited military economy that is being spent elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. It makes us all poor. And we're not in a really great position right now anyway. Yeah, right. I don't know if you've been to the grocery store lately, but things ain't great. Yeah. It'll continue to drive up prices, and of course they'll have to print more money to do all this anyway, so inflation yeah. will continue. Yeah. And uh, the the productive capacity of the economy will essentially be exported. Yeah. Or the, the production of the economy will essentially be exported. So we may be working here, but we're not getting the benefits from it. Yeah. Yeah. And nobody is. <laughs> yeah. Actually. Right. Yeah, it's not being put towards productive uses. So this is a, this is a terrible idea, yeah. and this is bad for all of us. Yeah. Um, except for Lockheed and Northrop Grumman and General Dynamics. And I will say this is actually what Trump had wanted, though. He wanted NATO to pay their fair share. Like that was one of his complaints. It wasn't my favorite complaint from him. My favorite mm-hmm. complaint from him was, well, what good is NATO? Why do we even have this anymore? Yeah. Because I think that's a fair question. Mm-hmm. Um, but but it, it did come up either while he was in president. No, it was when he was running, I mm-hmm. think is when he talked. It came up while he was president too, but it, it was like yeah. definitely a part of his campaign. Yeah, about um, wanting them to all pay their fair share. Yeah, but at that time he wasn't talking about getting rid of NATO. He was talking about forcing everybody to pay what they were supposed to instead of the U.S. Yeah. footing the bill for everyone. Yeah, which is kind of what this is getting towards, right? 
What do you mean? Um, the guy that we listened to, he's wanting them to pay more, more close or start moving towards a wartime economy. Yeah, I, it, it's not about. It, that's true. I mean, I guess that they would end up spending more of their um, gross national product on military things and contributing more to NATO. Yeah, by building military equipment to prosecute a war. Yeah, I'm not saying I'm for it. I'm just saying <laughs> <laughs> that that. But that's that's what. I mean, I'm sure Trump's sitting back going, I've been saying this for years. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe. I, it's unfortunate that the whole Russiagate hoax thing went on this whole time and made it impossible for Trump to have normal relations with Russia. Yeah. Because that's what we need. I mm-hmm. mean, we don't, I mean, that's that would be the goal. Yeah. Should be the goal. Yeah, absolutely. The It's the, the actually, I guess it's the largest nuclear arsenal in the world. Yeah. Like, yeah, why, 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 why can't we work with these people? Like, seems like it would be safer. Yeah, at the exactly. at the very least. And what do the the truth is? What do we care? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sorry. Like, even if Russia took over all of Ukraine, yeah, how does that affect us? Yeah. Oh, that, okay. So that's another thing that Russia could have done is like all these sanctions. Yeah, they could have done them themselves. It obviously hasn't hurt their economy. Yeah, uh, but they could have um, withdrawn energy. Uh, production for Europe until they um, enforce the the Minsk agreements or something like that. Yeah, and and of course, you know, I'm backtracking a little bit here, but a big Those. part of the the reason the the Minsk agreements were never enforced is because the U.S. wouldn't back them. Uh, because Zelensky ran on, um, he campaigned on um, on. <laughs> Sorry, because we're in this other room. I can't. I hadn't closed the cats out. So yeah, they're, like, they're, they're very distracting. Yeah. <laughs> um. Anyway, uh, he he could have said, um, "Oh, okay." So the yeah, the U.S. wouldn't back Zelensky once he was elected. He was elected by a landslide by saying that he would enforce the Minsk agreements. Yeah. And uh, then um, the the nationalist movement within his country literally threatened him. Yeah. And he could have done it still with U.S. support, but the U.S. wouldn't provide it. Oh, wow. And so then he, he it was like... Now he's stuck between a rock and a hard place. Yeah, uh, he was, self-preservation kicked in, and yeah, here we are. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, this whole thing's just a mess. I, I, still, don't, I still don't know exactly how this unwinds. Um, I... You would hope that it would be negotiations, but Merkel and Poroshenko's comments make that really difficult. Yeah. And the fact that the U.S. has never made any attempt really to get negotiations, and in fact, they've hindered them. Um, we could have been done with this uh, in April. Yeah. 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 Instead, oh, uh, we're hammering on the year. When's when's the year mark? The February 24th was 24th. the invasion date. Okay. So, so we're almost there. Yep. Um, before the end of this month, three weeks away. Yeah. Three weeks from today. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, we got the, uh, oh, I guess I, we should mention briefly that um, the 911 call and the, uh, the body, body cam. cam footage came out for the Paul Pelosi attack. So you would think those things being released, well, that would answer a whole lot of questions about what really went on here. Well, I, but as I'm sure most of our, the people listening already know, it really didn't answer much. I mean, it eliminated some things, I guess. Yeah. Um, kind of. It did confirm uh, some of that original reporting from the guy who got um, suspended or whatever afterward. I can't remember his name. Was this CBS? I, whoever he yeah. was with. Uh, that seems to have reported it accurately, but then it was the story was withdrawn and he was suspended. And <laughs> yeah, you wasn't supposed to say that. <laughs> yeah, um, but I I have to say that I'm surprised uh, to find that um, a lot of that story was true. It seems like just exactly what it was claimed to be, which is so bizarre. <laughs> yeah, right. Like I said, you would think. Releasing that stuff would answer some questions, but man, it's just the whole scenario is so bizarre. Yeah, like uh, the nine one one call was was so ridiculous. Like all I could think listening to that nine one one call is, "What's wrong with this stupid woman on <laughs> on the nine one one line? Yeah. Why can't, why is she not picking up on this?" You would think like, she's been hit by a hammer. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, like I mean, I get that the call that they were being weird on the other end of the call. Yeah, uh, because they were like, I mean, but like you were saying earlier, I mean, it did. He was. It did seem like he was subtly trying to tell her, "Hey, I need help here." Yeah, I didn't think it was that subtle, <laughs> but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, and the, in her defense, she did send police out. Yeah. I don't think it was like in an emergency fashion as it should have been. Yeah, it was just, just like a go checkup. Yeah, yeah, like a health check or something. Yeah. Um. Anyway, I just, it's <laughs> so weird. Yeah, strange situation. Um. Yeah. So I, I admit that like the conspiratorial thinking there doesn't seem to have panned out. It doesn't seem to, yeah, it doesn't seem to be. But it's it's still bizarre though. They didn't help by withdrawing the true story. <laughs> it well, still yeah. seems weird. Yeah, the like, way they let it hang out there, and it was, and this stuff was only released because of um, ah, oh, what was it? Wanting the freedom of information. It was one of the judges, I guess, forced this stuff mm-hmm. into the public, um, into the public sector or whatever. Because um, yeah, the Pelosi's didn't want this out. Like they didn't want this video released. Which is still, which is even more bizarre. Like, were they more okay with the conspiracy theories than the truth? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, Nancy wouldn't answer any questions on it. I saw that. She claimed that she didn't even watch the video. Yeah. Hmm. Well, there was some other uh, body cam footage released. Yes, there was. On the Tyree Nichols um, murder. I, I think that's the correct word to use. Yeah. I don't know how else you could describe it. I mean, so this guy, he's like 29, um, had no record as far as I know. Yeah. Um, was pulled over for reckless driving, supposedly. Yeah. And it was violent right from the start. I mean, they ripped him out of his vehicle and threw him down and... Yeah. Which seemed totally unnecessary. Yeah. And, uh, and he's, you know, he's saying, what did I do? (laughs) Yeah. Right. (laughs) Or I didn't do anything or something like that. And then they're telling him to get on the ground. He's like, I'm on the ground. And, yeah. um, and then it, you know, then the, the beating started, they like tased him and squirted him with pepper spray and yeah. were being very rough with him. And, and, in, and there was like moments where they're saying, get on your stomach, but there's a guy on the other side of him holding his arm, like preventing him from rolling over onto his stomach. Yeah. And, um, at some point he got up and tried to run away. Which at some point, I don't I, think that's unreasonable. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of the best. I mean, obviously it didn't work out, but no. I mean, what else? What else was he going to do? Like, and that's that's more sprint training. I guess so. Uh, I mean, it really is ridiculous though, and that's something that that comes up a lot is where you have a bunch of officers together. And they start giving commands Mm -hmm. and they start contradicting one another Yeah, where you've got different ones telling you to do different things. Mm -hmm. And you've got to understand somebody that's because I'm one of these people, by the way, like you don't want me talking to the police. Like I'm just telling you, I'm not that guy (laughs) because because I get nervous around them and, Mm -hmm. and I feel like justifiably, but. Like you don't know how people are going to react, and the officers should be trained in de-escalating situations like that. Yeah, um, and that doesn't seem to be the case in any of these scenarios. It's always ratcheting it up. Well, I, I'll tell you when I when I saw this, I thought that, that it doesn't add up. Yeah. To me, it just it made me think of like a mafia beating. Yeah. Like that there was a message being delivered to this guy. Yeah. For some reason. For something. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, I have no idea. I did hear there's like a rumor going around that he was uh, sleeping with uh, some officer's wife or something like that. Yeah. Um, which, that would actually put some pieces together. Yeah. It hasn't been debunked. I can, I, I yeah. at this point, as far as I know. Um, and to me, yeah, same thing. To me, it would make more sense. Yeah. I mean, because when you watch the video, it just doesn't seem like any of that was caused for it, mm-hmm. called for at any time. Yeah. So, and all these guys were, the police officers were all part of the Scorpion unit to um, focus on, like a special task force to focus on violent crime in particular areas. Yeah. And, of course, there's a whole bunch of laws out there that uh, 
that the enforcement mechanism, well, the, I guess that invites proactive policing. Yeah. Because when we when you and I were first talking about it, you were talking about that it just seemed like fishing to you. That yeah. They were pulling over somebody to see if they could find something. Yeah. Which um, I feel like that's what these aggressive units basically are tasked with doing, mm-hmm. at least as best I can tell. Yeah. Is Come that, up with a reason to pull them over, see if they've got a gun or drugs. Yeah, exactly. Because that's what they're trying to do is get those type of things off the street. Mm-hmm. So how do you do that? Well, you go fishing. Yeah. Um, and I see your point on that. Uh, my my response at the time was that they surely ran this guy's tag before they pulled him over yeah. and saw that he had no record. And yeah. I would think that if you're doing stuff like that, that you would focus on you're people looking that for, had a record. Yeah, uh, uh, and that would kind. make sense. So, I mean, I don't know. Um, of course, once the once they caught him, it really got out of hand. I mean, there's a guy oh, yeah. that's like running back and kicking him in the face and... Yeah. Um, it is really difficult to watch. And I, I have, the other thing is that I, I do kind of want us to try and keep things in perspective here. Um, this happens too much, yeah. certainly, but it doesn't actually happen that much. Yeah. Uh, so in, in a year in the U S there's a, around 10 million arrests, Okay. like roughly 10 million arrests a year in the U S. Um, I think that's too many, but continue. Oh, no, I agree. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's a, but but even among those 10 million, um there's between 1000 and 1200 people killed by police yeah. a year in the US. Okay. It's like a pretty small percentage of that 10 million arrests. Yeah. Um and uh, only like 40 to 50 of them are unarmed people. Yeah. Okay. So so it is it is really a small number. Yeah. Um but I, I have this other note here that I'm not sure what I meant when I wrote it down, so I'm just going to read it and maybe right. we can maybe suss it out. Yeah. Um, I wrote down, uh, please uh, represent disparities in society and enforce them. So yeah. I, I think that what I, was, what I was trying to get at to myself is that like these, the police themselves are an elite of sorts. They're yeah. not held to account in the same way that normal people are. Yeah. Um, and uh, the... And a lot of it, I think, although I didn't write this down and I don't know how I would get this out of that, but now that I'm thinking about it, um, they're also like, because they are the enforcement mechanism, like everything bad that happens in through our politics and government is brought to us by the police. Yeah. So all those lockdowns during um, COVID that were completely unjustifiable and illegal doesn't matter. Because they were enforced by the police. Yeah. They're the boot. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what they are. Mm-hmm. Like, you know. With the billy club. <laughs> yeah, with the billy club. Yeah. Boots and the billy club. Yeah. Um, no, what, so there's been a lot of talk about the George Floyd Act or bill mm-hmm. um, that's came up in the past week or so since this. And um, I, so I've I seen a little bit of reporting on it, and I, I guess I knew about this at the time when all when it came up the first time, but I didn't really look that closely at what all was in it. It doesn't seem like it's that bad of a bill. Um, a couple of the big things that stood out to me, one was doing away with no-knock raids, mm-hmm. like just ending that. Um, I don't see how you can argue it against that. Like I... I'd like to hear like a strong argument for no knock raids. Yeah. I have nothing but problems with them personally. Yeah. Um, well, uh, they would be even more easily um, abolished if you abolish the drug war. Yeah. Cause that's what they were instituted yeah. for is to prevent people from like flushing the cocaine down the, and I guess as toilet. a person who's an anti drug warrior, that's the reason that that one burns me up so much mm-hmm. is because that's strictly what that is there to enforce. Yeah. I mean, the other argument is that if you know that it's violent people that have firearms or whatever, you don't want to give them a warning that you're about to come in the door. You remember that scene yeah. in Point Break where the um, they realize that it's cops at their door and they start arming themselves up ready to, yeah. to yeah. Yeah, <laughs> shoot the cops as they come through? Yeah. They're trying to avoid that kind of thing too. But I, I, would, um, I would suggest that no-knock raids actually create more uh, violent interactions between people and police than they prevent. Than they prevent. I would I absolutely agree. Um, something else that was in there was, of course, in ending qualified immunity. Which absolutely. I know that there's a lot of pushback from that on the law enforcement side 
for logical reasons, mm-hmm. but it's something I support. Like, I mean, that's not something. Yeah, that, absolutely. It, it just, um, it just really limits accountability to a great degree. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the, the way, I, I mean, and I'm, and I get the way I, it was intended to be applied and the way it's actually applied are not the same thing. Exactly. Um, if, if it was, cause I understand that these people are doing the job and, and I, I think they should be held to a different standard. Mm-hmm. I just think it should be a higher standard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, the idea of the, the lone cop going into dangerous situations and being totally outmanned and so forth, it's kind of a myth. I mean, I'm sure mm-hmm. that it happens from time to time, but yeah. mostly they avoid if, Mostly they avoid those situations and almost all of these things that we see yeah. that end so violently like this, it's a bunch of cops and one bad guy. Yeah. And that guy might not even be so bad. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of times he's not. And that's yeah. the problem. And um, uh, so they're, you know, they're exercising a great deal of force when they have the advantage already. Yeah. And of course, you know, most people aren't running around the streets with body armor on. Yeah, and, and these guys pretend that they're, um, you know, so vulnerable. Yeah, but they're not. They're less vulnerable than anybody else out there. Yeah, and I, I don't <laughs> want to take away from the fact that they have a difficult job and they're mm-hmm. in a difficult situation. Yeah. Um, a lot of that could be fixed through reforming some of our crimes and laws. Yeah. Um, but at any rate, I don't remember specifically what else was all, I know those two were in the George Floyd bill. I don't remember specically what else. It was like four points and that was two of the two big ones. Yeah. There's a a libertarian guy. I can't think of his name right now. I've been getting, um, like emails and stuff from him. I think he's maybe running for the nomination for president in 2024. Yeah. Which makes it bad that I can't remember his name. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it wasn't somebody that I knew before, yeah. though. But um, I got a, a message from him yesterday or today by email, and one of his and he used to be a police officer. Yeah. Uh, and one of his suggestions was that um, police should be uh, forced to carry liability insurance, essentially yeah. like malpractice insurance for um, in the medical field. Okay. Um, and that that would create some accountability in this. And I thought that was actually kind of a, a clever it's a, idea. It's an interesting free market solution. It, exactly. Like this is, this costs them. Yeah. And so they have to, you know, you want to get those premiums down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have less incidences. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, um, there's, there may be something to that. Yeah. And of course the, the, the best solution would be, a real free market solution that yeah. um, that the government wasn't providing your security, your security in the first place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and well, I, I know people are going to bristle at that, but um, y- you know we'll spend like we'll spend a, like, a good time, a, a good bit of time, sometime going through that how down. that could work. Yeah, um, but the main thing is that they're they're so. Pro- I guess uh, the best thing I think it was Albert Camus who said um, that. Whenever the government does our business for us, they do it worse than we would and at greater expense. Yeah. And the same applies to security. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And a lot of people say that if you went to a, a free market, to a private uh, security issue, that um, that the rich would be protected at the expense of the poor. Yeah. Uh, you know, that or would be better protected. The poor wouldn't be able to afford protection. The rich would be well protected and so forth. Yeah. The first thing I would say is that that's not a whole lot different than what exists I mean, right now anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I don't think that that's true Yeah. anyway, because you have, you know, rich could hire private security for themselves, but poor communities can hire security for the community as well. Yeah. Like it gives you like collective well, bargaining power. And, and community watch type things mm-hmm. where you've got people in the community that are just kind of looking out for one another. Right. Um, I mean, that's how I would envision that kind of playing out. Well, the other thing, you know, one of the big suggestions for um, reasons for private protection uh, is, you know, like insurance would handle that. Yeah. Because yeah. they have an, they have a vested interest yeah, in your property being protected. There's an incentive in protecting your property. Yeah. Where the police don't have an incentive to protect your property. Oh no. There's yeah. It kind of uh, and that was proved way. over and over again, proven over and over again during the um the BLM 
protests and so forth when they degraded into riots in the in the nights. Yeah. And when police left. forces would just abandon areas. Yeah. Well, and if anybody's ever had their car searched, they know that the police have no <laughs> interest in protecting your property yeah. or making sure your property is taken care of. Yeah. Just start uh, ripping stuff out. Ripping stuff. I've seen some cars ripped apart by some police. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the other thing I just wanted to kind of mention as far as like with the George Floyd Act mm -hmm. and the thing that we talked about it at the time and it really just irritates me to no end is that this and, and they're doing it even though it was four black, black police officers and a black guy that was was killed. Mm -hmm. The race element still just keeps coming up. Yeah. And, and it, it just, uh, the reason I want to mention well, it was the first thing that Biden said about it. Well, it just brings into stark view the, uh, the dangers that, uh, black and brown people face in this country with police. Yeah. Or something like that. Which is, which is absolutely ridiculous because the truth is, is this is not a race issue. This is a policing issue. Like strictly speaking, like race doesn't play a part in this. Um, and shouldn't. And when the when the BLM um, marches and all of that stuff was riots or whatever was all going on, it all they really did was divide people up. Because truth be told, people were upset about George Floyd, regardless of their race. Yeah. And if if it had been an issue of okay, well, this was a black guy and a white cop, but we're focused on law reforming law enforcement in general. Mm -hmm. And that had been the focus. I think they could have got something done, but yeah, they immediately right. pushed people into their corners, mm -hmm. and and it just you're never like, going. I don't deserve protection because I'm the wrong color. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, and I even think conservatives, as much as they're like you know, I hate to use the term bootlickers, but mm -hmm. I mean it is what it is. <laughs> um, I think that they could they could look at that incidence and see okay like something does need to be done here like what what can we do but you immediately push them away by by forcing the race card mm -hmm. um, I just and it, it irritates me to no end and they're doing it again with this yeah. um, I just I don't see how we ever try to fix any of these issues if we can't move past that because it's it would be different if it was legitimately a race thing mm -hmm. but it's just not it's it's a policing problem yeah. Um, no matter how much you want to believe that, uh, that police are out there to protect people's property and lives and rights, yeah. that's secondary to protecting the government who's, who they actually work for. Absolutely. And that's important to remember. And on the racial issue, you're right. I, I think that, um. Uh, you know, the problem isn't about race. The problem is about militarization, a lack of accountability. Yep. Um, there's, you know, a bunch of things that are going on, but those are two things that are right up there at the top. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, uh, so, and there's, like I say, I mean, we're never going to get our perfect libertarian solution, mm -hmm. but there are things that could be done that would at least help. Never say never. Well, I mean, I'm all for it. Like, don't get me wrong. But, I mean, I do feel like at the least, though, you got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know? You know, I, I would still think that a good place to start would be um, the abolition of crimes with no victims. victims. Yeah. Uh, the the whole drug war is about, vict is about criminalizing um, voluntary uh, consensual activities. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And the, the drug war is is what fuels so much of this. Yes. I mean, if, if the truth be told, if you dissolve the drug war, like all of these fishing expeditions, like what we were talking about at the beginning of this, that goes away. Yeah. Well, most of it anyway. A lot of it does. Yeah. Um, because then what are they fishing for? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there, I mean, there are things they can be kind of fishing for and, but it's more stuff you'd want them to be on the lookout for, you know, like, mm -hmm. I mean, if a kid was kidnapped or that kind of thing, you yeah. know, um, it, it's not like drugs, like, because that's, that's the easiest thing for them to fish for and try to, and try to pin you on, mm -hmm. um, and get these type of difficult encounters started. Yeah. So then we'll just switch to red flag laws. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a, another time, though. Yeah. That. All right, wait, you ready to wrap up? You got more to say on no, that? No, I think I'm good, but it just, like I say, there's the solutions are out there, and but we've really just got to, to work together and move past this whole race baiting yeah. thing. 
Yeah. So. And uh, start thinking outside the box in terms of like maybe the government isn't the best entity to entrust with your protection. Yeah. I mean, if just you, start thinking about it. Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of interactions with cops and I've had some good interactions with mm -hmm. police. Like I have, like I've, yeah. I've, and there's, and there's a lot of good, like when we were on our way up to Tennessee. Oh yeah. No, that's a prime example. Well, yeah. when I get hit by the drunk driver that time, like mm -hmm. that cop was amazing. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, they're out there and there's a lot of good cops out there, mm -hmm. but well, the numbers say that this isn't a thing that's really that common. Yeah. So, but we can do better though. Yes. So we can do better. We can do better. Be better. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let's see. What's next week? All right. Nothing special about next week that I can think of. Nothing I can think of. So, um, yeah. So we expect to be back next week. Probably on our normal day, but who knows? Yeah, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sometime towards the end of next week, you'll probably hear from us again. Yep. In the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook and subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, and Podbean. Uh, like and share, comment, um, criticize, review, tell your friends, et cetera, et cetera. All that stuff helps us out, and we really appreciate it. And uh, we'll be back next week when we finally get this right. In the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Later.